are listening to Coach Mike on the Mic. Let's Talk Hoops, a podcast that brings hoop fans together and their stories to life. Coach Michael Herrera is a Texas high school basketball coach with three state Final Four appearances and a lifelong fan of the game. He'll sit down with coaches, players, and fans to share stories, game perspectives, X's and O's, and lessons learned along the way. Now, let's talk hoops. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in, guys. This is episode number one for Coach Mike on the Mic, Let's Talk Hoops. For my first episode, I looked no further than tracking down one of the pioneers of making all of our hoop dreams stay alive. Today, I had the privilege of sitting down with 90s basketball player and Hoop Dreams documentary star, William Gates. William Gates was a player that we all got to watch on the big screen and watch his Hoop Dreams story unfold right before our eyes. Hoop Dreams was released in 1994 and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Film Editing. I hope you enjoy reliving some of those Hoop Dreams memories with me today. Now let's talk hoops with William Gates. What do you think kids today need to do to make Hoop Dreams a reality instead of a dream? And what do you think is missing in today's basketball players that we may have had back in the 80s and 90s? I think one of the things that's missing is, you know, Let me address it this way first. I'm not against AAU. I know a lot of people are against AAU and and sure, there are shysters out there, but like I tell people, there there are shysters in the high schools. I mean, there's shysters in college. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast itself. So it's like to say, you know, you you can't throw the baby out with the bath water. What, What I think, kids are missing is that element of the the tough love component of the game you know you can't always tell them how great they are you know you got to challenge them you know even my kids they 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 knew coming up hey if you ask me to coach you i'm going to coach you i'm and i'm going to coach you hard um because that's the only way i know i don't i don't I don't, now if you want me to be dad, then I can't coach you. <laughs> I can be dad at home, but I can't be dad inside of this, these lines. And they understood that. It took them a minute, but they understood that, man, I ain't never seen dad get this mad before. Oh, dad gets mad because you ain't hustling. You ain't working hard. You got more. You're young. You're 15. You're 16. Why are you tired? So I think that element of, having them push themselves beyond what they can do, a lot of that is missing. I'm also going to say, I think one of the things that's missing from the game right now is that I don't, I don't see the fundamental skill sets that we used to. Um, and of course, I see a lot, I, I see people doing drills in the gym and, you know, and, and, and even my son and I, we were in the gym this morning and, you know, he was kind of looking at me saying, Man, Dad, but when I get the ball, I can do this and I can do that. And I said, son, oh, that's great. But when you actually don't be able to do that. Let me play that back for you one more time. I'm also going to say, I think one of the things that's missing from the game right now is that I don't don't see the fundamental skill sets that we used to. Um, And of course, I see a lot. I I, I see people doing drills in the gym and, you know, and, and, and even my son and I, we were in the gym this morning and. You know, he was kind of looking at me saying, man, dad, but when I get the ball, I can do this and I can do that. And I said, son, oh, that's great. But when you actually don't be able to do that, I said, the truth is, when you're in a competitive game, you're going to have maybe one or two seconds to do something with that basketball. If not, you got to swing it. You got to move it. So I said, you're not going to have time to play with the ball. I said, that's NBA because they, they don't. Matter of fact, if you don't shoot it fast enough, the, the, the NBA, it's entertainment. It, it's designed to be a show place. But I say when you're competing on a high school level and if you're able to compete on a collegiate level, I said, son, those things that you always like to work on, those are weapons. That's not your 
everyday game. Your everyday game is getting to your spots. Your everyday game is making that hard pass. Your everyday game is getting back on defense. Your everyday game is using the athleticism that you've been gifted with to help your team win. And I said, if you don't understand that and start riding in that, man, you're going to, you know, like our coaches used to tell us, man, you're going to be so far down on the bench, you're going to need to use your cell phone to see if coach still up there. <laughs> so I think kids, they, they, they miss that aspect of it. And it's hard to give it to them now because you got, you got, you got parents who either they played the game or they didn't like the way they were coached or they think they can coach it better than you or, or you got, you got, you got parents who are riding so much on it that, you know, why, why isn't their son, you know, getting 20 shots a game and you're like, you know, we playing AAU. I got nine, 10 guys. Everybody wants to make it, not just your kid. We try to give everybody an opportunity. So, you know, you're always trying to find that balance of pleasing the player, pleasing um, the parents. And so I've always just been under this um, belief here. And when I have my parents meetings, you know, when I used to coach AAU, I would tell them, hey, if you're going to have an issue with the way that I coach, might be time for you to leave right now. I don't mind having a conversation with you, but um, just know your conversation is not going to go very far in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, you know, as a basketball program. Because uh, if, if, if I let your vision coach me, then, then, then I'm hurting these guys. I'm, I'm going to hurt your child. I said, your child needs to be able to hear somebody else's voice besides yours. And I used to always tell my parents this. They didn't like it, but I meant it. Do not yell in my stands. I don't need to hear you. Why, why do I got to turn around and see you the one up there acting crazy? No. <laughs> you know, I remember I, I did a, an event up in Dallas, and um, one of the parents had asked me, it was like, man, how do you know when enough is too much? And I said, very simple. I said, when you go to the game and you can't enjoy the play. I said, if you sitting up there and you burning and you and you anxious and you and you mad, I said, you you missing it. You missing the game. I said, if you and then you're gonna look up and you're gonna like four years went by and you're gonna try to be recollecting all of those thoughts, but I said you won't have them. All you're gonna have is thoughts of you being angry at your child. Mm -hmm. or angry at the coach. I said, enjoy the game. Whether they score 20 or one or none, play 20 minutes or no minutes. Look at your kid's face. You know, and interesting enough, my wife taught me that. You know, when I was coaching my older boys when they were younger back in Chicago, because you know, in Chicago, it's the grind. You know, it's, man, it's kill or be killed. And she gave me some great advice and she was absolutely right. She said, you know, they don't have to do this. And I said, huh? What do you mean they don't have to do this? <laughs> they do gotta play. She's like, no, they don't have to do this. So she was like, coach them. Get them to understand what you're trying to do. Teach them. And man, that changed my concept. Like these kids really don't have to do this. But if they are gonna commit to it, you got to give them everything you got and make sure that they understand it. So I never wanted one kid to leave me uh, that didn't understand. As a matter of fact, we had, I had your kid last summer, uh, Nick. Okay. Yeah. Nick, Nick played with me, you know, and I, and I kept telling Nick, I said, Hey man, you got an opportunity going to see your senior year to play. I said, you, you know, you can get some time, but I said, man, to get on any coach's court, you got to be able to guard somebody. And I said, not that old high school wave defense y'all play. <laughs> you, got, you got to settle in, man. You got to sit down and you got to, you got to show them that you, you want to do this. And, and unfortunately, you know, he got hurt a little bit. I thought they could have helped you guys this year, but um, he did. He played really well for us uh, during the spring. He kind of struggled a little bit during the summer, but uh, he, he, he played hard. And I, and I was just looking at it from a 
defensive side because you know every kid think they can score. Yeah. But from the defensive side, I was I was really excited to see him want to guard the best guys. I said, man, you got to keep that type of mentality. So I think that's it, man. I think kids just need every once in a while, uh, kind of like how my coach did for me, and uh, that realization that the game don't owe you nothing. And I got that lesson even from my college coach. When I first got to Marquette, Kevin O'Neill gave me some great advice. He was like, hey, Will, man, it was an honor recruiting you. I am so glad you're here. As quick as he said that, he turned around and said, but it's a responsibility for you to stay here. I was like, man, you're absolutely right. I got a responsibility now. I signed my name on the dotted line that I would give you everything I got and in return, this school would pay for my college education. And he was right. And if I didn't give him everything I got, I was cheating the university. So. Um, and ultimately, yeah. ultimately yourself too, right? Yeah. You know, but that's, uh, that's such good perspective, man, because it's, um, you know, hearing you talk, I, I came up with, with two words and they're nothing big, but foundation and commitment, right? You, you can't move on until those things are established in your game and in life. You're going right. to sign up that's for right. the military. You better have that foundation that they're going to be teaching you when you go to boot camp. And then you need to be committed to it. Otherwise, your brothers are going to fall, right? In that's the right. game of basketball, your foundation is in your skill set. What are you working on? Are you working on, you know, 20 foot floaters or half court shots and and one moves, right? right. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could be committed to that, but that's only going to take you so far. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, kids, kids, it, it, it is, it's, uh, and that's the part about coaching high school basketball is you got all walks of life, but you got to reach every kid and you, you've got to learn how you can push one kid and not push the other. Yeah. Um, I consider myself kind of like an, an old school kind of coach in a modern world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, I, I grew up in the Catholic school myself, kindergarten through eighth grade in San Antonio at St. Pius. So my foundation goes back to that real hardcore discipline. Um, otherwise your, your hands going to get swatted by a ruler, by the nuns, but um, you, know, you have, to, you have to have that foundation. So as a teacher and as a coach and, a, and as, as a, you know, a husband and a father, I'm old. I, I lean towards more of that old school method methodologies of life and coaching and teaching, but just in a modern world, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's really hard because I want to be hard on kids, but kids and parents nowadays, and I'll generalize that statement, don't know how to separate that. They don't know how they don't understand that I'm just another person trying to get your child where he wants to be. Therefore, I need to be that voice that you can't as a parent. You know, sometimes it's a lot easier for a coach to put your son in place than it is for you as that child's parent. That's right. And, uh, and, and it's very hard, but. Um, it is. It's difficult because cause coaches, man, you, first of all, you guys got, particularly high school coaches, man, y'all got one of the hardest roles out there because um, at the end of the day, um, yeah, they got the AAU coaches. That, that's. That's mediocre compared to what you guys do because see, you guys are seeing them on every level that we'll never see them on. You're, you're at school, you know, you're in the homes. I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal what, what, what high school coaches have to be in the life of a kid. And man, with all the talent that has come through still, Man, I'm surprised you guys ain't pulled your hair out because, you know, when you get talent, man, everybody got an opinion. Everybody, everybody hey, we've got, got we've got the front row. We've got the front row crew, man. The front row crew sits on that front row. And, and you, got, you got seven coaches on the front row in the stands, and then you got four coaches on the bench. So, trust me, I know. <laughs> so, man, hey, you know, I, I, yeah, it's difficult, man. But y'all but y'all been handling it, man. Y'all really have. You know, it's it's – it's just unfortunate that for a lot of these kids, the things that they need in terms of, and, and, and we always say this, is I'm really just trying to prepare you for really when the game is over, when the ball stop. They're, they're never prepared, but they, they don't know how to persevere. And unfortunately, we all can persevere when the ball is going through the net, 
you know, I, you know, I used to tell people, you know, like even when I was teaching church, I would always tell the congregation, hey, how is it that every time when things are going great, your relationship with God really dwindles? But as soon as trouble show up, all of a sudden, you know, you want to find them, you want to call and ask for prayer, you want to have meetings, you want to have talks. And, and to me, a lot of times, you know, that aspect of sports can get like that. And my father-in-law told me this again. You know, I got people who always throw little niggas in me. He said, you know, when everything is going great for you, man, you ain't going to listen to nobody. But when stuff hits the wall, he said, you'll listen to a rock if it'll talk to you, <laughs> you know. And, and he was so right because what he was saying was, you, you, you can't... You, you can't overlook any aspect of anything that is going to help you get to the places that you want to be in life. And unfortunately, a lot of our kids skip steps for success. Because if you got a kid that can run, that can jump, that can shoot, that may be all that he can do. But he can't dribble. He can't make a good pass. He can't guard anybody. He don't want to guard anybody. But yet, you got parents in your ear saying why isn't my kid getting any attention why isn't he getting up more shots you know what are y'all doing in practice how much basketball do you all know i'm sure they didn't attack y'all basketball qualification what did y'all know and, and where did you play at it and how far did you make it you know you're just going like first of all let's get some realization this is high school basketball you know there's there's, there's a million kids who were all conference all tournament that just went to college normally. They didn't go to college to play basketball, but they were just, but they were great and decent high school players. So I'm like, calm down a little bit. So, well, on, we on, a, on behalf of all the, the coaches that are going to be listening to this, man, thank you for, for that because that does mean a lot. Um, I think that sometimes coaches don't, don't get the accolades in terms of what we do for kids outside of the game because. Everything is so basketball, basketball, basketball. But once again, man, there's more to this life. Uh, then we'll touch on that in just a second. But um, I'm just going to make a statement, but it's a question. And you, you address it how you want to. Coach Ping. You know, interesting enough, people looked at the relationship between Coach and I had, and they actually thought that we didn't like each other. But that was actually uh, never the case. Ping. Uh, in many regards, yeah, like most coaches, you're going to find moments where you just disagree. I mean, if you got a guy that always agrees with his coach or anybody on everything, then you're not thinking. You, you, just, you, just, you just take it in and you just, you know, he, he can say the sky's purple. Are you okay with it? <laughs> no, I, I think coach always respected the fact that I wasn't afraid to say what I needed to say to him. Uh, but at the same time, I never disregard the role he played in my life. Um, he didn't have to bring me out to St. Joe's. Uh, um, sometimes I'm still confused how they even found me all the way down in Cabrini Green. I mean, I was, I was playing in an eighth grade tournament. And interesting enough, one of the assistant coaches came to see me play because uh, he had heard about me. Um, and our game got canceled. So I was just kind of in the layup line, doing some different things. And all of a sudden, um, I had dunked the ball, cause in, and he saw me dunk the ball, and he turned back around and said, hey, what's your name? I said, uh, Will. He said, Will Gates? I said, yeah. He said, did I just see you dunk the ball? I was like, yeah. He said, can you do it again? I was like, yeah. So I went over there and dunked, him, dunked the ball again for a bit. And uh, next thing I know, man, I was out in St. Joe's walking past the Isaiah Thomas trophy case out there. But but Ping was my guy, man. He 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 um he did everything that coaches should do in terms of challenging you, pushing you. He made you angry, he made you mad. But what I loved about him was his coaching style, and I even use it to this very day. He never put you in a position that was gonna hurt you or his team. So I remember there were times when we were being practicing and he would be killing us, killing us, killing us, killing us. 
and I will come down and I will make a pass. And he'll look at me and go like, William, what was that? That's what he mean, coach. He said, why don't you pass the ball? Why didn't you just go shoot it? It's like, huh? Listen, you can get around that guy. Go around him. But the next time you come down, you go around the guy, William, why you ain't pass the ball? Coach, you just said go around him. I need you to know the difference. You know, he did things like that, you know, but he wasn't trying to play a mind game with you. He was trying to get you to think on the floor. And so I love that aspect about him. Like I say, man, there are times that I despise that guy. But let me tell you what happened. Freshman year at college, first home game, who do I see in the stands? Coach Gene Pingator. I see him. Joker drove 130 miles, not 130, I mean an hour and a half, almost two hours, to come up to Wisconsin to watch me play my first college game. And not only watch me play, waited after the game, talked with me, let me know how proud he was, even in spite of I didn't go play for Bobby Knight because that's who he wanted me to go play for. <laughs> but he was just like, man, this is everything you ever wanted. You're here now. He's like, enjoy it. And he was right. But everything that I got from him, and this is what I've always told my boys and even the kids that I coach, man, the, the things that I got from him really prepared me for college. When I walked into Marquette, I was ready to play. And not because I could shoot the ball or score the ball. I knew how to guard people. I understood positioning. I understood help side. I understood man ball. I understood how to go under screens, how to go over top of screens. I understood, you know, my positioning and where I was at. I understood where everybody else needed to be. I, I, I got all that from him. I knew every aspect of a defensive mindset that you need to have without being nasty to guys. Like, I didn't have to be Pat Bell. I, but I knew how to guard you. I knew if you could shoot, I could watch you in the layup line. Even Kevin O'Neill, my college coach, he used to say, hey, Will, what about this guy? What are what, what, what we doing today? It's like, Coach, I'm going to guard him this way. I need so-and-so to do this. And if my teammates didn't do it, I would go up to him and say, hey, man, I need you to be here on this. This is going to happen about six times today, and I need you to be ready all six times. And I got that from Ping, and it just, it just stayed there. That's why a lot of guys don't like to play for me down because they're like, man, why are we spending so much time on defense? Because if you can't guard anybody, who's going to kind of want to watch you play? And yeah, you are, you are who you can guard. That's right. You know? <laughs> That's right. Because you can, be, you can be a threat offensively, but if you can't guard a player, you are who you can guard, man. If you think you're a guard, you know, now the game has evolved, right? There's no such thing as a, as a power five, you know, guy sitting down in the post. And if you do have one, Man, that's a great asset to have on your team. But in today's game, you know, you play five out, people think they can shoot. So now you got these kids on the outside of the perimeter think you can shoot. Okay, right. go guard the guard then. That's right. That's right. And that's when you right. can't, then it's like, guys, like this ain't, this ain't uh, women's basketball back in the day when you played either offense or you played defense. You got to play both, you know. That's right. So, that's right. You know, I tell you what, you know, listening to you talk about Coach Ping, it just uh, – it's so hard to get kids today to understand when we have those conversations, when we're hard on you in practice, when we stop practice to call you out for doing something. It's not to call you out. It's to call attention to something that everyone else needs to hear. So let you be the example. It's so hard, but um, I think you and I have that in common as a basketball player in terms of, you know, I played for a coach who was, who's pretty harsh too, but um, I, I mean, I learned a lot you know, and I went, I went off to college and I didn't get recruited to play college basketball, but the knowledge of the game was there. I was taught the game. I was taught, you said, going over screens, under screens today, you know, kids, you know, or schools, I'll say schools will be a zone school or you'll be a man school to me mm -hmm. as a high school coach. I feel like I need to prepare these basketball players for wherever they're going to go play college. Cause I don't know if you're going to play man. 
I don't know if you're going to play zone, but it's my job to make sure that that coach gets prepared. So I'm right there with you, man. I'm a man-to-man kind of guy. I love pressure defense, but I love throwing in some uh, some crazy zone action too. But um, And I also think the big thing is too, man, if, if these kids can not get so easily offended, and like I said earlier, it's hard for a 14, 15-year-old to not be easily offended. I mean, we just – when you're that age, everything offends you. Their parents yeah. offend you. know, the food offends them. I mean, the wind, the sun offends them. I mean, everything – offends them and that's why I just think they need to be taught the lessons that sometimes in athletics that's the only place you can get it that's why I really wish parents would just let you know athletics be athletics you know even you know my boys played for Cliff Ellis you know first thing I told Cliff Ellis I said hey man you ain't gonna have to worry about if I'm gonna show up for your office for a parent meeting I, I can see up in the stands and I can tell you this I already know what they're doing wrong I would correct that <laughs> before I ever show up in your office for a conversation. And I wish more parents would be that way. That way. Quit trying to correct the coach. Correct the bad behavior. Correct if, if correct the turnovers. Correct the, you know, do the things you need to do at home. Well said. Let's play that back again. That way. Quit trying to correct the coach correct the bad behavior, correct if, if, correct the turnovers, correct the, you know, do the things you need to do at home, you know, and, and to me, that's, that's just the, that's just the part that we got to play as parents, you know, so we don't get in you guys' way, because, because, I mean, the interesting thing is, I don't expect you to come in my house to tell me how to, you know, parent my kid. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that role. And I'm, and I'm a, now, that don't mean you can't offer me up advice and be like, hey, hey, well, man, so-and-so today was just like, man, everything good? Oh, wow, that's great. We need that. And, and I'm going to do the same to you. I'm like, listen, man, so he, he's just been having a tough week. So, you know, I don't know that how his practice has been going, but I'm going to let you know, hey, listen, you know, Will Jr., man, he just, for whatever reason, he in the funk. Maybe his girlfriend broke up with him. I, I don't know. But, you know, to me, that that's how you communicate with a coach, you know. And at the same time, help that kid to say, hey, listen, man, you, you got to prioritize this thing. <clears throat> Even my youngest boy, I told him right now, I said, man, listen, we're going through COVID. We all going through COVID, man. <clears throat> and I get it. It's your senior year. Are you ready? You re-energize, you want to show the world you can play. I said, but you never know. It may happen, it may not happen. I said, well, the priority is this. Let's do everything you still need to do. You still need to get in the gym, you still need to shoot some shots, you still need to work on free throws, you still need to, you know, stay in shape. Because I don't know how I many of these kids actually running. I said, you still need to stay in shape. I said, but the other thing is, the most important priority right now is, man, you're gonna be doing school at home again. So that needs to take priority. I don't know what time your check-ins are, but I need you to be up at regular school time. Get up. I need you sleeping. I don't care if your check-in is at 10. I need you up at, hey, just like you're getting ready to hop on that bus, get up. Because I said, if, if you don't ever get back into a routine when you really have to, man, you're going to fight it. You're going to fight it. So, um, yeah, man, it's just you guys. You guys deal with so much, man. It's just, it's, yeah. Well, I wish, yeah. I wish we, had, I wish we had more, uh, more parents like you that had that again insightfulness to to do that. You know, and I love the way you said that to to correct, uh, you know, the turnovers, correct the shots because you know everybody wants to be a coach from the stands. And Coach Hubbard here at Steel always talks about it. He goes, he goes, he said this all the time. I can be undefeated from the stands too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's right. That's right, man. Coach Hubbard, man, we gotta pray for Coach, man, because <laughs> he be getting it, man. I'll be right around, man. Still the best team in the state. They should never lose a game, man. Everybody loses. Everybody loses a game. You ain't gonna win them all, man. <laughs> I mean, and I said when he lose, he's like, he's like every good coach. He's gonna dissect and build on it and say, hey. 
this is what we need to do to continue to get better. I said, man, how did how did how do y'all miss this? We I was playing. This is this is the process. Yep. But they do. They do. But yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's fast forward a little bit here and kind of wrap things up here. But I do want to touch on this and, and, and kind of get your uh, perspectives on this. So I learned I did not know until I did some some research and read that you became a pastor. So a couple of questions here. You know, what what led you into ministry? Are you still doing this now? Or just kind of talk a little bit about that. Sure. I uh, believe it or not, man, I grew up in a household of faith. My grandfather uh, was a pastor and. Uh, but I think the thing that kind of really pushed me in it was when my brother uh, had passed. And, um, and I was just sitting around trying to figure things out. You know, I was living in Wisconsin at the time. And, you know, I was working for this organization called uh, CETA. And it was the largest non-for-profit agency in the world. Doing extremely great. Then all of a sudden, uh, they lost their contracts, their government contracts. So I kind of laughed about it, but, you know, they had to let a lot of us go. And, but the way they let me go, it was interesting. I had got a personal letter, an overnight letter, a letter in the mail, and, and a phone call. So I got four ways I got fired <laughs> you know, from one job. And I was just kind of like, you know, stuck in a sense. I, I, you know, I was at that point where, uh, you know, I think, you know, we was going through that recession and everybody always said, well, if you ever need anything, give me a call. So, you know, everybody you call, but nobody had nothing. And the more I was calling people, I couldn't connect with the people I needed to. But on the ministry side of it, I had friends who would say, hey, Will, come on down, man, let's go to lunch. And, and I remember this one lunch, uh, breakfast I went to and I walk in the room man uh, there's probably eight or nine pastors in there and I look around and I go like boy I know you I know you I know you these are like famous pastors like Tony Evans and I'm just like okay why are y'all here what's what's this breakfast about what, what we're getting ready to do and they looked at me and said well we're here for you so what do you mean you're here for me we're here to pray for you, your success, and your calling in the ministry. I said, did I get that call? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all tell me about it? And it's like, well, man, we believe this just to be, you know, God in your life. And, man, they prayed for me. And, and again, after that day, man, all ministry doors just began to open up. And uh, so, of course, you know, uh, you know, I started the ministry in the community. Went to school, you know, got my master's in biblical studies and, and uh, just kind of just like, okay, wow. And, 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 and my ministry in, in Cabrini was because was I, I, that community was transitioning, you know, the community began to gentrify. So uh, the people were literally were being, you know, moved out and into different communities. And so what, what we were doing was helping people as they were moving out relocate and find other ministries to settle their families into. At the same time, what we were doing was uh, we should do the second tier ministry where guys who were coming home from prison, we was helping them reincorporate themselves back into their families. And, uh, and we was trying to teach men to be men and, you know, wives to be wives and to depend on each other and love on each other. So, um, I mean, I had an absolute uh, great time doing it, but obviously there was there was a lot of turmoil, you know, in my ten year history there. Man, I had buried over two hundred and sixty five people. Two hundred and sixty of them were under the age of sixteen, mm. you know. So you always had to, you know, I was dealing with that aspect of it, of you know, you know, having parents deal with the loss of. Their kids, because you know, no parents want to leave before their kids leave. So it was a lot of that, and you know, and few weddings, but many funerals. Uh, and so, but in the end, uh, and this is why I'm always big on foundation, 
we wanted to put a foundation in people that, hey, your 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 faith grows by hearing and by hearing the word of God. And, and the more you practice that thing, the more you read it, the more you spend time in it, um, it'll get embedded in you. Um, and and you'll be amazed at what looked bleak really it isn't as bad as you think it is. And that's coaching. That's kind of like how I live my life. Um, things that look terrible, it, it, I mean, it could be the worst. But at the end of the day, on some level, I still believe that it's still a way out. There's still some hope. There's, there's, we can fix it somehow. And for me, if, if people just start with the truth, you're halfway there, you know. If, you know, and I know a lot of people like to expose themselves, and I'm not telling anybody to ever expose themselves. But if I ask you, hey, man, are you all right? Do you need anything? Don't say no when you really do. Just say, hey, man, yeah, this could be a little bit better. And the, and the, and the truth is, don't be embarrassed. And you might need, might need more than what I can give you. But that don't mean that I may not know somebody who can do something. We always think the source and the help needs to come from the person that you're talking to because we can get a little embarrassed and we don't want anybody else to know our business. Well, the reality is, and again, this just goes back to basketball, nobody's gonna make it on their own. You need a coach. Coaches need players, you know? Parents are a part of it. You know, it's that, it's that, it's that fullness that needs to be there. So ministry, uh, Minister, the great role, and and to answer your question, yes, I still preach, uh, um, teaching over at Higher Ground uh, Christian Ministries. It's actually right by Judson High School, okay. so uh, so I'm teaching over there. Uh, like everybody else, we're doing the Zoom yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, deal on Sunday mornings. But uh, man, I love um, preaching the Word of God. I could probably say this. Um, probably love doing that man more than playing basketball it, it has been very rewarding in terms of having peace in my life very rewarding not just you know in every aspect from my wife to my kids uh, you know a lot of people don't know this but when we came to san antonio man we don't have any family here but we felt like you know god was saying hey move to san antonio and man, we took a leap of faith. And here we are still eight years later. Our family stopped, we were crazy. Friends stopped, we was crazy. Even people that I've known in the ministry thought I was crazy. But I had told them that uh, this move was not about me. This move was about what God wanted in our life, but also what God was doing in my family's life. You know, my wife and my kids, they had followed their dad around for ages i mean since they were born and my wife god bless us so follow me you know we just celebrated 27 years last week thursday and she's been following me around for 30 of those <laughs> you know 27 years so it's it's but it was it was her turn she needed an environment where she could grow and become her person and be the woman that god needed her to be she didn't have to be a first lady she didn't have to be you know, Will Gates' wife from Hoop Dreams. She wanted to be Catherine Gates. And God brought us here for her to have that opportunity. And she is. She's, she's excelling in, 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 in her world. And, and even with my boys, you know, um, when we first got down here, man, we didn't know what school to go to. Uh, you know, we know nothing about Steele. We know nothing about Clemens. As a matter of fact, the first school we was told about was Lady Bird Johnson. We just didn't want to move in that community. And, uh, and then the realtor brought us over this way. It was like, hey, you know what? This is a community called Shirts. She can go over there. So we just we went to Shirts. They should have <laughs> taken you about two miles down the road, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We could have been, they could have been at Steel. I mean, we just, we didn't know. We didn't know Cliff Ellis. We didn't, we didn't know anybody. It was just, got here and, and and I remember when, when we got here, I uh, I called the school and asked to speak to the coach. It's like, hey, listen, man, I'm bringing my boys in. You know, uh, you 
guys have a basketball team. I didn't even know if they had a basketball team down here. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the new coach. And um, he said, man, I, I, I would love to, you know, meet you and talk with you about your family. I said, okay. So we went up there and met with him. And he looked at me and said, man, please tell me you ain't Bill Gates from Hoop <laughs> I said, yeah, coach. He said, man, you got to be kidding me. I said, yeah, you know, me and my family, we moved down here, man, and I just want to connect my boys in school. And this is how crazy it was. I think school started on August 26th, and we got here, like, August 20th. So <laughs> we was humping, man. We was humping trying to make it happen. And, and before I knew it, I mean, nobody kind of knew we were here. And, and of course, after the, the first 10 games, people was like, okay, Clemens got a kid over there by the name of Will Gates Jr. He's averaging 30 points a game. We should go take a look at him. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, it, and it was good for him. I, I think even being in the city, you know, you know, he, I tell you, he, he came out of a great class too. He was part of that 2013 class. But, you know, I, I tell people all the time, the conference that he played in, on one night he was playing Jabari Parker, the other night, you know, <laughs> I mean, this was his conference, you know. <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm like, he needed uh, to come to an environment where he could he could puff a little bit, you know. Because in Chicago, everybody got a dog. Everybody got a dog. Even if, I mean, I keep telling people, Pat Beverly is not uncommon. That is the norm. Aggravators irritators there's a lot more of that in midwest basketball they're grimy they just they just they want to hit and be hit i mean that's midwest basketball and i say it's a lot more than that there is no finessing in that so but it was good and of course you know Jalen went on to have you know a great career down there for coach ellis and you know my youngest boy marcus he's following in their steps so it's like i said the move was more about them than it was was me so i actually came in and thought i was going to retire but god said no i still want you to teach so uh <laughs> so uh so i've been doing that man and you know still traveling and speaking and and um and coaching these kids man i want every kid to still have their hoop dreams you know and however far that takes them uh i want to use my platform i want to use my voice uh I want, you know, I love talking to coaches on their behalf and saying, hey, come check this kid out. I'm honest with coaches. Hey, he's he's six foot three. He's quick. Shot struggles a bit, but I think if he if he puts the time in, he will be a really great contributor with you. So and, and and for the most part, man, I just I just try to stay out of people's way. You know, sometimes you don't even know I'm in the gym, and I—I I mean, I sit all the way up in the back in a corner someplace. And, and by the time halftime hit, I'm gone. Well, uh, well me. God willingly, we'll be having a season this year, and you'll have to make your way from the top row to the bottom row, and 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 formally introduce ourselves to each other this year. But uh, yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. It sounds like our, our our story here from hoop dreams to uh, to hope and faith. Um, I just want to say thank you again for taking some of your time and sharing your story and visiting with me on this podcast today. So I, again, it is an honor to have you. Thank you for sharing your story. And uh, I don't know how I can help you, but in any way that I possibly can, man, feel free to reach out to me. And, and uh, again, thank you so much. And I appreciate you doing this for me. Absolutely. Coach, man, my pleasure. And I got you never now, man. So it's good. Very well. Well, take care. God bless, man. And we'll catch up soon. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening to Coach Mike on the Mic. Let's Talk Hoops. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure you subscribe and click the notification button and then share it with your friends. If you're so inclined to do so, would you please rate and review this podcast so that I can help grow this community of listeners? I hope there was something that you heard today that entertained you or connected you to the game of basketball. If you'd like to be a guest or know someone who would be a great guest on the show, please comment below or reach out to me on any of my social media platforms. Until the next time we meet, the ball is now in your court. Be someone's champion today.